uh, I lead a small team at Google called the Data Arts Team. It's part of the Creative Lab. We basically just get to make really fun experiments and art projects that push the technology forward. Awesome. I think we live at a really exciting time. I mean, right now we have computational power and storage, uh, which is really enabling radical new ways of communicating. Um, um, the way I think of the future of interactive storytelling is basically creators crafting mini brains. There are these little systems that we're able to create. They're autonomous storytellers. And these storytellers have at least three superhuman abilities. They have amazing storage. They have interconnectivity throughout the planet. And they have a perfect memory that can replicate and create these databases, which are, are amazingly useful for, for storytelling purposes. That was I mean, I think creating computer software is kind of like creating a little brain. You have the storytelling slave. So basically, this little brain is totally one-dimensional, and it's only focused on doing exactly what you want to do. But it's a totally different thing from like a book or a film, because it creates this dialogue, this interaction, where you're able to poke and prod, and it's able to craft a story specifically for you. Now, specifically, how is it? I think it's not to say stories are going to become more complex. Stories are, are, are going to become uh, you know, always interactive. I think there are opportunities, and there's trade-offs, uh, and it's an amazing space to be exploring in. I think there there's times where you want to sit back and you want to have something fed to you. And then there are other times where a bit of inter interchange, a bit of exchange, a bit of play can really add to the story. And especially living our lives through them. I think actually our lives are really just a series of stories that we're, we're telling ourselves. And what's really in intriguing by, with this technology is we're able to tell ourselves these stories and then impart part, parts of these stories into these systems. And we can have dialogues directly with them and with others uh, through this technology. So it's really kind of extended technology. So it's really kind of extensions of our brains. We're able to, uh, to share our stories and the constraints of those stories, not just vocally, but through these systems of audiovisual stimulation, which is pretty exciting. The sharing story. Totally. I mean, I think... Being able to communicate through, you know, across the planet is a, actually a pretty amazingly new thing. And it's allowing us digital technologies that we're now able to communicate across the planet. And we're able to communicate uh, across cultural boundaries, geopolitical boundaries, uh, and really kind of bring us together uh, as a planet. And, I, I, think, and I, I think what you get are really rich, unique interactions that you wouldn't get from just bumping into your friend down the street. You wouldn't get from, uh, you know, grabbing a slice of pizza. Uh, this is this is really about fundamentally different ways of communicating that strips away a lot of the other context often, and it's just brain to brain, and maybe it's only across one or two dimensions. But I think that can enable some really interesting exchanges. It's really exciting. Let's, let's stay on track on the. Mm -hmm. In a way, with the global communications, it's almost like people across the planet are dreaming together. There's this imagination that's coming about by people interacting with one another and creating this totally different thought space, uh, which is only enabled by communicating across the planet. Perfect, perfect. Right. I definitely think like the exchange of ideas is really what drives progress forward. And what we see is these technologies are enabling a totally different kind of exchange of ideas at an extremely fast pace. So I think to... And when we create these little brain systems, if you will, they have the, these amazing attributes. They can they have perfect memories. They have the ability to communicate across the planet. Uh, and they, they, they're also incredibly smart. Uh, despite the fact that they don't have any creativity to speak of, they're incredibly fast at uh, doing certain types of calculations. So if we take these... And with these mini brains, we basically have the capability to create stories that are specifically tailored to the individual viewer, uh, whether that means calling up data that's relevant to them or whether it's about changing the speed and the parameters and, and actually guiding the story uh, as they interact with it. Uh, and the other way that they're totally different is it allows people to collaborate and actually guide the story themselves, to put a piece of themselves into creating something totally new. Um, to be honest, I actually despise the word crowdsourcing. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, I think that doesn't really do justice to... I'd love to see a new word come together for this idea of collaborative creation because I think it's really... My first experimentation with collaboration online was a project called The Sheep Market. It's basically using Amazon's Mechanical Turk, which is like the eBay for brains. It's like, how do you pay people? And you, you can pay people and you can get them to do tasks online. So for the project, I, I thought, hey, I'll pay people two cents and I'll get them to do this ridiculous activity. I'll say, draw sheep facing to the left and I'll pay you your two cents. And I started collecting thousands and thousands of hand-drawn 
drawings of sheep. And it was amazing to see the humanity, the, the individuals shining through in this gigantic churning system. It was just kind of chugging through their intellectual property and their, their own uh, uh, human creations. And I thought that that juxtaposition was really powerful, that here's the human and here's the large machine. Um, about what does it mean? What, it, what, what does it mean for us to be working on projects that we don't understand as part of a larger whole? Um, and, and kind of what is the role for mental labor uh, as we move into the future? Um, so it wasn't really meant to be heavy-handed, but it is definitely a critique of itself. Here's me using the Mechanical Turk, which is meant to be a tool for making money uh, and using it in a way that kind of makes it look at itself. Really, uh, kind of how does this work when, we, when humans are connecting from across the planet and creating something larger? I think it's a, it's a powerful, interesting, and maybe even disturbing thing. Really? Yeah, I mean, I think what happens here is you've got this broad data, database and specific aspects of it are really relevant to individuals. So if you can target that and you can say to this specific individual, now I'm going to deliver this content that's super highly relevant, and it, it, it really creates a totally different kind of experience and it puts the person into a different mindset uh, and, and creates something that's unlike anything you could otherwise have or experience. I think what was happening with this project was we had this amazing data set which would allow us to you know, really hone and tailor spe to specific individuals and drive home an amazing emotional resonance. Uh, and I think this is a, a kind of technique that will become increasingly uh, valuable uh, as, we, as we look towards the future of storytelling. technology called WebGL, which is basically like cramming a PlayStation or Xbox directly in your web browser. It gives you access to hardware-accelerated graphics and it basically enables you to create real-time rendered on-the-fly graphics. So we want to see kind of what can we do with this? How, how could we create an experience that's changing for each individual person and really feels like an exploration into a new world? Uh, so so this, this project was really kind of a lucid dream. You're moving from one world to another, uh, and eventually you enter this landscape that is inhabited by all these strange creations created from people across the planet. It, there's a, a voxel creator, which basically like Legos and 3D, and people are building their own models that then get cast into this desert landscape. Uh, so uh, another kind of amazing aspect of digital technology is this idea of open source, an idea of sharing and being able to build off of what other people are creating and working on. Um, so in that frame, uh, so we, we thought, well, what would happen if we allowed them to guide the actual trajectory of the storyline? What, uh, what would happen if we empowered them to create their own stories uh, and allow people to branch the stories in different directions? And what, we, what we landed on was basically creating these seeds, these uh, kind of ideas for what a tree could be. Uh, and a number of Tate artists, uh, Oliver Eliasson, uh, and Julian Opie, and a number of others, created some seedlings that then people can branch off of. They can create their own little animations that build off of other animations and end up creating these trees of totally different narrative paths and trajectories. When you say trees, what do you... So each individual tree starts with a seed animation. There's basically a, a really short hand-drawn animation and a series of instructions. And those instructions kind of, in theory, guide the trajectory of where the story is going to go. From there, anybody can pick up and they can take the last frame and create their eight frames to continue that story. And in those eight, eight frames, you end up continuing to develop in small pieces uh, the trajectory of the story that can branch off a number of different ways. Okay. I, I... Yeah. Yeah, in a way, it's kind of overwhelming. You get, you're, we're getting just tons of content, and you can kind of dive in and decide which types you want to look at first, but ultimately you can never really wrap your head around the entirety of it. At least that's the... That's the kind of aim of the project, I think. I like that. So, yeah, I, I, with this project, it's not like a film or a book where you just consume it and you've got it and you walk away. This is like getting lost in a forest, quite, quite literally. You're wandering around and you're collecting this story and looking at that story. And uh, I think the entirety of it is well beyond your grasp, which is kind of a, 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 nice, uh, a nice experience to have. Yeah, I think coding's a whole new way of storytelling. I think when you write computer software, you're you're explaining things kind of in their constraints as a system. And it's different than, than just describing something using adjectives. Uh, and I, I think that's definitely influenced some of these projects, this idea of the exquisite forest being like, like kind of like a software, a programming repository for code where you're cloning and forking and you're taking content and taking it a totally different direction. Uh, I think there's a lot of interesting things to be learned from coding uh, in terms of the ways that we communicate and the ways we think. And it's not yeah, it's funny because I grew up with computer games, and I think 
I still totally enjoy and love playing computer games. But at some point, I started to realize that a lot of the interfaces uh, and experiences that I was loving from games were also applying to other aspects of my life. Uh, and I think there's a really interesting interplay um, between useful interface and cultural object and gameplay. Uh, I think where all those things meet uh, is, a really, is really ripe for exploration. I, I think throughout history, uh, our lives have been rich experiences by just intrinsically because we live in the natural world. And I think something happens when you take things digital where oftentimes the context gets stripped down and it becomes numbers uh, and text on a clean, plain page. And I think there's a lot of room for us to explore and take kind of re-embody those experiences to make them culturally interesting again and make them experiences, not just kind of ext extracted text and data. But I think like, I think the best games really are great stories. You, you see rich character development and ultimately you're in a similar mindset. You're putting yourself into this, this kind of virtual existence. Um, and ultimately I don't think the st distinction is too important. I think there are awesome stories to be told with or without objectives, with different amounts of interactivity. Right. Learnings was just this ability to tailor, an ability to make something specifically for an individual can create amazing emotional resonance. Uh, and I, I think that that's a really interesting area to look more at. All of the future discoveries and inventions, all of the new technologies have largely come from dreams from the stories that we tell each other and our projections and our thoughts and fantasies. So largely, really very tangential, but there's this fascinating thing when you think about what's actually happening. Somewhere out there, there is a teeny little metal disc or uh, thing that is changing state from one to zero. And it's leaving these traces of our thoughts and our actions. And actually, even when we view something, we're actually participating in it now. Like, it's actually leaving a remnant. There's this fascinating thing that's happening online where we're leaving digital traces and those traces are telling other stories and there's meta stories on top of stories. Uh, and I, I, it's crazy, to, it's just crazy to think about um, the existence of this kind of network that's being created on top of everything. But that's kind of like, I think the biggest difference for me using digital technologies and storytelling is kind of the disembodied thoughts, the I'm going to take this structural system and create something that lives outside of me. And now this little brain or whatever you want to call it can be accessed by others and they can manipulate it. And they're no longer manipulating the thought that's inside my head, but they're manipulating this kind of creative, this structure. This, uh, and I think that's really interesting that, that, that that entity that's created can exist and be accessible anywhere across the planet and be sliceable and diceable across a number of different dimensions. Uh, and be something that people can manipulate and mold and uh, and create with. I guess mostly what guides me is my personal curiosity. And if it's something that's going to be interesting for myself personally, there's a chance that somebody else out there is going to also find that interesting. So just following following whatever you're excited about and whatever combination seems weird and exciting and new is generally a good trajectory, good direction to go. And how else would you... Um, just, create, just taking something and rebranding it is really just theft. <laughs> but when you take that further and combine it with something new, that's when creativity happens and it becomes an amazing opportunity. So I think if I was going to ask for something, it would be people really radically recombining crazy new things to, to push us further and not be redoing the same thing. What kind of story